this church has just been fantastic. The choir and everybody just faithful, and uh, they're sick of black and white. And uh, it's, it's coming quickly to an end. There are robes on their way and real soon, as soon as they can get the music director to get them together. Uh, he's a little slow, but everything else is really well. He has trouble. But we are, uh, we've got so many things on the burners that, that are exciting out in the future. We feel like the Lord has put in our heart to do. Uh, the Vineyard record, it seems that Vineyard and Integrity, how many members of us recording an Integrity record in June, was it? You remember that? And then in July we did a Vineyard record uh, with, with uh, Eddie Park, and he was here on a Sunday morning. Well, both of those records are coming out at the same time. And so I think they're supposed to, Joan told me that there is a, a delivery, maybe. They said they'd drop ship us the Vineyard records maybe on the 10th. So the Vineyard tape will be here on the 10th, and we think the integrity of September. And then September 20th, we think the integrity record will be here. And lots of things happening. And so just to let you know where we're headed, what the Lord has put on my heart that we need to do is start just, we, what we want to do in the music department is basically take what's happening in these services. God's pouring out. And with every revival, there's always been music. Every revival God has ever sent to the, the world is usually accompanied by music. And, and what we want to do is document in music. We're not in this thing, you know, folks said we're making a mint and all that kind of stuff. And just let me, let me assure you that every dime that, that's taken in at our table back there and everything that's happened is being put in right back into the ministry. We've had, we've, we're, we're starting to have to hire some staff because it's so overwhelming the amount of people coming back there and the amount of product that's being moved because people are so hungry for the revival, they call all during the day and say, anything you got, send it. You know, so a lot of folks are standing off in criticism and going, well, you know, they're getting commercial around there. Well, let me ask you, put the shoe on your foot, what would you do? You would say, you know, I remember a time when revival wasn't in my church, and if I thought it was happening somewhere, I'd say, whatever you've got, I want it, send it. So what you have to do, <laughs> so what you have to do when you're on the giving end of that is go, okay, how do we do this? So every day I understand from Rose and the folks in the office, it's a new day. Uh, but what we want to do is the Lord has really laid on my heart to do an intercession record. We want to do some music that will, that will go along with the intercession that's going on that's really behind this. this. Lila and I are going to talk some more about that. And we don't, I don't even know how to, I don't know how to approach that. That's never been done that I know of, but we want to we want to put music together for a bed for for people to pray and intercede to, and I don't know what all is going to happen. There, there's all kinds of things we got to do. Brownsville number three, but I'm saying all this to say that w I'm very very excited this morning. Could Bill, would you come up? I'm going to embarrass you. Would, would you and Lisa come and just for a second? Would I would I be embarrassing you too bad to get you to come up here a second? This is Bill and Lisa and Sira, and uh, everybody always asks, Bill and Sira, and what's his wife, so his wife's name is Sira, Sarah. It's Bill and Lisa and Sira, and Bill and Lisa have come on staff, and there's, this is their first Sunday here, and uh, he is going to be assisting me and be a chief musician and just help me with everything we're doing. He's going to be putting all of our music into book form so that Brownsville 1 and 2 and all the choir rehearse arrangements will be available to other people. And he's going to be helping me with the keyboard and help me we rehearse the band. And, and Lisa herself is also an, an accomplished musician and a great pianist. And, but right now she's wife and mother, and she does everything and keeps Bill straightened out. And we are excited about these folks. And I, I know it's a little bit embarrassing, but listen, I know it's when you get up there, it's like I feel weird, but I'll try not to make this. But I want you to know what the Lord's putting together. The Lord is bringing us people that are quality people. It's not, it's not a situation where we're going, gee, could we just get anybody? We, we put the word out a few months ago that we were looking for someone, and Bill and Lisa came down here, and maybe Bill can share that at some point. And uh, I do want you to say a few words, so get ready. Uh, <laughs> but, but Bill and his wife came down here in, Jul was it July for the first time? June the first time. And uh, they were very happily working. Bill is, was a producer.
still is a producer. He worked with Dynam Records. He's worked with various artists you'd know, DC Talk, and a lot of names. If I named them off, you'd go, wow, ooh, ah, Yolanda Adams and people like that. And uh, he was doing what I was doing in Nashville and very happy about doing it. And uh, came to this revival, and the Lord just stirred up his heart. And he thought, man, we need to be involved with that. And we started talking, and, and they just got hungry. And they came back a month later and brought a whole couple of pews of folks or a pew worth of folks from Ohio with them. And they're excited about the revival, and they just want to be a part of what God's doing. And I'm so happy to have them. And I want you to make them welcome. Good morning. We are so very excited to be here. I don't really know if words can express uh, what's been happening. Uh, last week we were living in Nashville. Uh, <laughs> this week we're uh, living in Pensacola. Um, we're so very, very excited. The first time we came down, uh, I'd gotten a call from uh, Benny, and uh, he said, you need to come down here and check this out. There's something really interesting going on down here. So uh, it happened that Grandma was at the house watching the boys, and uh, I said, honey, let's go down. And uh, we, uh, I don't know how happy, she, how, ha <laughs> how happy she was to come down here, but when we got down here, it was like, and, and it's something you have been experiencing for a year, you know, we, we walked in, and the Spirit of God just, you know, just lit me, and it lit my wife, and uh, we were going to church in Nashville, uh, involved in the, in the city outreach there uh, with uh, Brentwood United Methodist Church, uh, Dr. Joe Pennell there, and uh, thought we were just really doing great in the Lord. <laughs> and we came down here and, and just experienced what, was, what, what you all have been experiencing. And it's almost like getting saved again. I mean, it's like the Lord just... It just opened my heart up again and uh, for deeper and wider things. And uh, uh, we were talking with Linda last night. We, there's so many possibilities here and so many things here that uh, I'm just so excited, just absolutely thrilled to be here and to, to serve the music department here. So thank you very much. God bless you. So I just wanted to let you know that. I know it take a little time, but I want to do that because God is putting together something here. I don't know what's, what he's up to, but he's up to something good. And, uh, and I'm just excited, aren't you? Yeah. Hallelujah. What do you say we just worship the Lord?
Listen, come on, let us sing. You may be seated. There is a hope in Jesus. Come on, Angela.
There is a hope in Jesus, and there is a healer in the house. We got to do it one more time.
sick and lonely. I have good news, good news to bring. You see the healer's name is Jesus. They tell me he is Well, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to your name. We praise you, Lord. We give you glory. We give you glory. We praise you, O oh Lord. Come on, lift up your voice with me. Let's worship him. Come on. Hallelujah. We praise you, O oh Lord. Glory and honor to you, O oh God. We bless you, O oh Lord. We bless you, O oh Lord. Oh, praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We magnify you. Jesus.
realize what you're singing. I will bow down. And I hail you, Lord, as King of kings and Lord of lords. And I will be your servant and serve you, Lord. Lord, I give everything to you. Give you everything.
as we're worshiping the Lord, when the brothers come and start to serve communion, come on, continue to worship the Lord as they come right now. If the brethren of the church would come. Those of you in the chapel, if the brothers will come over there again and also serve communion. We're going to go to the Lord's table. Hallelujah. of your love. For the fullness of your love, I am so thankful. You died in my place, oh Lord. I'm thankful for your love. Sing it again. I am so thankful for the fullness of your love.
right now, just forget about everything around you. I want you to think about how good God has been to you. Just think on his goodness and worship him. More than the air. More than the air. sing that again. The ushers are still delivering the cup and the bread to everyone who doesn't have one. Please be patient with us this morning. We have a capacity crowd. But I feel that there's people here. You need some stuff washed away from your life this morning. There's filth there. There's junk. There's sin. And friend, there is nothing like being washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's, I watch every night in this revival, people come the first night, and I see them get saved, and then the next night, they look different. They just, their countenance has changed, and they're, they're free. You don't need to carry what you're carrying, friend, and we're going to sing this one more time, and the Lord will wash you clean this morning. You won't leave out of here the way you came in. He'll wash you clean. It's only the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. I'm going to say that again. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The blood has been shed, friend. Jesus paid the price 2,000 years ago. He'll do it for you right now. He'll wash your sins away this morning. As we sing this, some of you are going to decide this morning, this is the morning, that God's going to clean you up. This is going to be a... This is, I believe, isn't today September 1st? Friend, summer's over, man. Some of you gone all summer long. I'm going to tell you, this has been a sinful summer for some of you. 
it's not officially over. I think we got 15, 20 more days. But as far as school being, you know, school's back in session, for most of us, summer's over. And some of you have had a sinful, sinful summer. Get right with God today, would you? Would you get right with God today? And as we enter up to Thanksgiving season, with it just a couple months away, determine in your heart that you're going to enter this whole fall season on fire for God. And when the Christmas rolls around, you'll be so on fire for God. You've already been living for God for four or five months by the time Christmas comes around. You're on fire for Jesus. And when everyone's worshiping the Christ child, when we're singing, oh, little town of Bethlehem, oh, come all ye faithful, you have been faithful. You've been living for God since September 1st. Friend, I want you to sing this with me right now. Oh, the blood, he'll wash you clean. Oh, the blood of Jesus. I'd like for everyone, if you could, just remain standing for the next few minutes. Pastor's going to come and, and lead us in this holy time of communion. Two things I want to share with you. One is this. There's a lot of visitors here today. I know you've come down, and maybe this is your first time in a service. And Pastor and I, normally on Sunday mornings, because of the intensity of the revival all week long, we do not have prayer lines on Sunday mornings. We don't spend a lot of time laying hands on folks because the services have been so intense all week. But we really felt of the, of the Lord that there's some of you, this is your only service. And I want you to know that at the conclusion of this service, there will be some prayer team members. Prayer team members, listen to me. At the end of the service in the chapel and in this main auditorium, I want you to be ready up front. For any of you that are visiting for the first time, you've got to have prayer. I was already taken out as I was coming in. A lady came and she, she was here for one service. And you can see the desperation on people's faces. They got to be prayed for. You've got to be prayed for. So today we'll do that for you. We'll be praying for you, but you've got to come up at the end of the service. If you're here in prayer team member, please be ready. But right now I want to pray with everyone here who needs Jesus Christ to forgive you. Perhaps you're here for the first time and you've never ever given your life to God. Or maybe you are as backslidden as a prodigal son. You are so far from God. Maybe you're at the place where you're in the pigsty. And everything's falling apart around you. And you're coming to yourself. You're realizing, this is pitiful. What a pitiful life. Back when I lived for God, things were wonderful. And now I've slid away from Him. And the world has just come around me. And the, everything comes crashing down. And you've decided this morning, I'm going to get clean. I'm going to come clean before the Lord. I'm going to come back to my Father and ask Him to forgive me. Maybe that's you. You're a backslider. Maybe you've never known the Lord. We've had Muslims here saved, cult members. We'd have the Jews have come to Jesus. They've, they've met their Messiah. Perhaps that's you. You've never known the Lord. Maybe you're from a confused family where your father's a Buddhist. Your, your mother's non-religious at all. And you don't know what you are. And someone brought you here today. Friend, you're here under divine appointment. But listen to this preacher right now. You've got to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. Your time is running out. Don't live one more day outside of fellowship with God. And we're going to ask you to do something this morning. One of the things I love about this revival is that it's been very honest and very open. People are not uh, ashamed. If you've been here this week, we've had some of the most phenomenal altar calls of the entire revival. People running to the altar. On, I believe it was on Friday night when I preached on Ananias and Sapphira and spoke about the fear of God. And how if you lie to God and die, that we're asking God to bring that back into the church. Where Ananias and Sapphira, they lied to the Holy Ghost. And they dropped dead and fear spread throughout the land. I'm going, Father, bring that again to this church. Bring that to America because we've lost the fear of God. And when the altar call was given that night, I don't believe it was two minutes 
where there wasn't a spot left on the whole front. People ran and fell on their face. Last night, a young lady was literally carried. Those of you that weren't here, she was carried and dumped at this altar. She fell under conviction in her seat, and they dragged her and dumped her at the altar under the power of God. People are coming to Jesus. They're tired of it all, friend. They want to come to God. They want their sins forgiven. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do this morning. If there is sin in your life, you need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away. I'm going to ask you to do something this morning. It's very bold. It's very open. But it doesn't hold a candle to what Jesus did for you. He hung on the cross nude for you 2,000 years ago, friend. He hung naked, nailed to the cross for you. And what I'm going to ask you to do doesn't come close to what Jesus has done for you. But I'm going to ask you in just a minute, you're going to raise your hand if you need forgiveness. And if you've got a cup and a bread in your hand, you can put it all in one hand and, and raise up the other. But this is what I'm going to ask you to do. If you need Christ to wash your sins away, there's junk in your life and you know it. You're going to have to do this, friend. Gone are the days of this secret Christianity. Gone are the days, friend, of, well, I'll just take care of this at home. No, you're not. The devil's all over that, friend. He'll get you back at your home, and, and he'll say, this is a good place to do it. You just talk to God right here. Why? Because he knows when you start getting public, you start getting victory. When you start fellowshipping, and you get around other people that are hurting also, and you lift your hand in the congregation, the chains fall. He knows that. Satan knows that. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in just a minute. In the chapel, you're going to do this. Here in the main auditorium, but you're not going to do this number. Look at this. That ain't worth a nickel, friend. What's this? What is this? What is that? Christ did not do that. He did this. He didn't say, Father, I'll die for them in a secluded place where no one sees me. No, he died in front of them all. While they hurled abuses at him, he was crucified. And you're going to do this? What is that? This right here is I need forgiveness. This is what it's all about, friend. I need Jesus to wash my sins away this morning. Everyone in this room, everyone in the chapel, you need Christ to wash your sins away. There's sin in your life, and you need Jesus to cleanse you right now. Lift up your hand right now. Up high. Up high in the chapel. Lift it up. Lift it up. Lift it up. I need Jesus this morning. I need Jesus this morning. You can put your hand down. When you did that, I know exactly what you felt. There's a freedom that comes, friend. It's like, I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm coming clean. Everyone's going to pray together. From the pastoral staff to the choir to Richard and, the, and, and uh, Dick Rubin, every one of us are going to pray together this morning. No one's going to be excluded from this. We're all going to pray and ask the Lord to wash our sins away. If you raised your hand, this prayer is for you right now. Everyone pray with me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you that your blood washes me clean. I ask you this morning to wash my sins away. I have sinned. I have hurt you and I've hurt others. Cleanse me. I repent. I repent of my sins. Forgive me, Jesus. I ask you now to be my Savior, my Lord, and my very best friend. From this moment on, I will serve you all the days of my life. Come live your life through me. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask my brother here, Brother Terry, from Australia to come and join me on the platform. Hold your hands up again, pastors. Let me see who you are. Okay. Brother, right down here, the front one in the green suit. Come on up. We're going to do the Lord's Supper. I'm going to ask that these brethren help me. I'm going to ask you, if you will, please, Brother Terry, to pray over the blood, and I'm going to ask you to pray over the bread, please. This is a time that we get together every week. We do this weekly here at Brownsville. We've been doing it now for years. 
This is not ritualistic. This is not some kind of um, a ritual that we do in the church just to be doing it. But it's a hallowed time. We've come in this place. We've had the hilarity of praise. There's been the glory of the Lord that's descended in this place because singing a healer in the house and there is hope in Jesus. But now our attention is focused on the person of Jesus Christ. Not so much what he has done, but we're focusing now on who he is. And the Bible says that he is the adorable, the adorable, precious lamb and son of God. He is the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. What a price he paid. And we've come here this morning to take this cup and to take this bread and to say to Jesus, we remember. You remember what Jesus said before he left the earth? He said, as often as you do this, as often as you take this bread and drink this cup, you do it in what? In remembrance of me. God has a people all around this earth, but this morning here at Brownsville in Pensacola, Florida, we take the time to say, Jesus, we love you, and we remember what you did. How many of you this morning love him with all your heart? Would you bow your heads, please? I'm going to ask our brother, what is your name? Sam Bates, where are you from? East Davis Center of God, Little Rock, Arkansas. Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm going to ask you, if you will, please, to hold the bread up reverently and pray over it. And then after you do, lead the church in partaking of the bread. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for what the sin has today. For your love that has bestowed on Calvary mm. so that we can have life and have it more abundantly. Lord, it doesn't matter where we come from, how rich or poor we are. It doesn't matter what color, what race. But you shed your blood for all, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We thank you for this bread today, for this symbols your body that was broken for us. We give you praise. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Would you partake of the bread? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you this morning for Jesus. We thank you that the table's open for everybody to come. It's an open table. We thank you as we have confessed to you our sin, that you are faithful and just to cleanse us, to forgive us, and take away all our unrighteousness. This morning we receive of your blood, strengthening for our bodies, healing for our hearts, protection for our families. And we place ourselves willingly in this moment in time straight under your headship and lordship and plead the blood of Christ upon our lives. It's your blood that cleanses me. Lord, as we drink this morning, we drink of the blood of Jesus Christ. We drink in fellowship with each other. We partake literally of you. Strengthen, bless, and encourage each one here we ask in Jesus' name. Let us drink together. Amen. Thank you, Lord. If you will, please dispense of your cups. Go ahead and do that right now, if you will, please. I want to ask everyone, if you will, please, let's do what they did in the New Testament. After, after the Holy Communion, they sang a hymn. 
And I want you to turn around right now before we do that. And I want you to make yourself friendly to about five or six people near you. Just step out across the aisles. And I want everybody just to make yourself friendly for a moment. Benny, turn these monitors for me. Turn them. I need them to really hit me. Hey, brother, God bless you. Man, your cake blessed me. We used to Terry and Brock. <clears throat> Hallelujah. What's the microphone? Yes. All right, if you will, please. Where's that brother who just said he wanted to say a quick word? Brother, where you at? Come on, hurry. Where you at? There you are, come on. <laughs> Diane, come here. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, folks, after church is being dead and dry so long, isn't it great to have a move of the Holy Ghost back? Hallelujah. Well, Brownsville, it's good to see you this morning. I know that y'all haven't been able to come much during this summer because the crowds have been so huge. But we noticed this week since school started back in most locations that the crowds seem to have thinned down just a little bit. So I think you may be getting your church back. <laughs> How many Brownsville people do we have here this morning? Hold your hand up. Way, all right. Stand up. Stand up, Brownsville. I want to see you. Hey, hey. God bless y'all. Bless you. Amen. You may be seated. This brother here come up to me just a second ago. He said, I just got to say a quick word about what's going on. What's your name? Brother Anthony Presswood. I'm an evangelist. Are you? You're an evangelist. Where are you from? 
I'm from Chicago, but I've been in Clarksville, Tennessee since 79 and made that my home. Well, talk to us. Praise God. Glory. First of all, I want to thank God for men of God that'll say yes to the Lord and uh, evangelists, amen, that'll say yes to the Lord because um, back in Clarksville, we have a Monday night Bible study uh, just where the different churches come together and we worship and fellowship outside of everything else. And Brother Glenn, a lot of the brothers been coming up here from Clarksville to this revival. And I was sitting there after the Bible study, and he wanted me to watch the tape, and so we sat there and watched it. And as Allison and uh, Elizabeth began to, to testify, and this manifestation was upon them, that has been happening to me for years in prayer, and I just call it the anointing. I didn't know what it was, but that happened to me in prayer. You know, I love the Lord, and I intercede a lot, but... Um, as they begin to testify and the manifestation come and, and, and the things that happen, you know, I say, God, that's wonderful. I don't read newspapers and I don't watch the news. You know, I, I, my mind is on Jesus. I ain't got time for nothing else. And I say, Lord, I'm tired of this city, the, the papers, you know, when you see the front page, it's always what the devil's doing. I say, Lord, I want th this, the papers to read what you're doing. And as I watch that tape, glory to God. As I watched that tape, it just thrilled my soul to know that God is moving and he didn't start it in Pensacola. Glory to God. And the strangest thing happened when I got in my car after the Bible study as normal to go home. An uncontrollable tongue just came on me. It was loud. I was speaking in tongues and I, I couldn't go home. I stay in a quiet apartment complex with elderly people and I couldn't go home. So I'm driving around Clarksville trying to find a place to stop to see what's going on. I drove in a park and there was some people there, so I pulled out the park. I end up on the other side of town by First Assembly Church, uh, Church of God, uh, First Assembly uh, Church that I used to go to, and I pulled beside a bus, wasn't nobody there. And I say, Lord, what is happening? What's going on? What's happening? You know, the power is so strong, I'm seeing this in my mind. And all of a sudden, I, I felt the Holy Spirit weeping over that city. And I began to cry and weep because he was crying. And it was a, 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 a a deep from within cry. And, and he was weeping over the sin over that city and the people that wasn't accepting Jesus. Then he was weeping for the souls of the saints that's so cold and the pastors that don't want to fellowship. And you know, and I begin to repent. I'm a man that don't play with sin, but I repented. I say, Lord, give me a deeper burden for souls. Give me a deeper burden because of a man of God and an evangelist that'll say yes to the Lord, that love the Lord not selfish. I was here last night and someone said, you know, don't even put your tithes here. Your tithes go to your church. And if you uh, uh, want a fellowship with another church, you can get saved here and go there. That's love. That's Jesus. That's not selfishness. Praise God. And that's why the anointing is here. And I thank God for the man of God. But let me tell you something, honey. I hadn't been the same. I mean, after that tape and, and after what the Holy Ghost has done, uh, I was invited to preach at a church. And I just knew it because my prayer just changed. And, and when, I, when they asked me to come up to preach, as soon as I hit that pulpit, I felt Jesus step inside of me. <laughs> Woo! Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Woo! Hey! Woo! Go ahead, go ahead. Hallelujah! Go ahead, go ahead. Thank you, Jesus. God, we give you the praise this morning. You heard it, God. Woo! Hallelujah. Glory to God. Woo! Praise You know what? Some people tell me, brother, why, why are you so happy? I don't understand why Christians always running from the devil. I go devil hunting. You hear me? The de I go looking for devils. I mean, I, we possess the greatest power that this world has ever known. You got to know what you got and what you can do with it. Praise God. Let me make this short. <laughs> Let me make this short. As I began to preach, there was a young man that was in jail running from Jesus. And I invited him to the service that night. This man was standing on the back of the pews, holding the pew, saying, I'm not going up there. I'm not going up there. And supernaturally, his feet started walking. <laughs> Glory. Praise God. Woo. Glory to God. And then another brother. Another man was in the back under conviction so strong, he ran out. He told his wife, go up there and tell that preacher to pray for me. But he couldn't stay in the sanctuary. I mean, and young people would just come weeping and crying. I tell you, a God is a good God. 
huh? The church, we, we got the power. We got the love. Praise God. I just thank him this morning, and I love him. And I thank God for men of God. You know what? I've never seen this brother before in my life or him. But in the Holy Ghost, I feel the love that they have for Jesus. Huh? In the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Woo! You know what? I used to think the Holy Ghost was tongues. He's a personality. He's my best friend, honey. I'm never alone. And I love you this morning. I feel at home, and I love each and every one of you because I love Jesus. Don't touch me, man. Don't you touch me. Yeah, I know I can tell. What's that feel like when you do that? Brother, it's just like electricity. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's so powerful, it just makes me shake. But I mean, I have seen anointing so strong that I can't even touch people. When I do like that, they fall. <laughs> what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God. When I came in this place last night, when I walked through them doors last night, I stood up and looked at all of these people, and I cried. I cried because I'm used to seeing these kind of crowds at football games, you know, worshiping things that they shouldn't. But these people had their hands lifted, worshiping our God. I want you to know God got feelings. You hear me? God has feelings. And so many times as people breaks his heart, that, path, that, that evangelist did the same exact thing I did. The power of God is in here. The love of God is in here. And some people will stand back wholehearted. Well, and you almost have to just drag them to the altar. You got to love Jesus. That's the secret to your Christian walk. You got to love Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. God is doing mighty things. I thank God it started here. You got something here. You got a man of God that loves God. You got an evangelist. God sent them here. Praise God. That makes a difference. God, we praise you. We praise you, Jesus. We give you the glory. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Thank you. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Hey, wait a minute. Hey, come here, brother. Come here, brother. Hey. What you think about the singing in this white church? Oh, my Jesus. I don't put a color on nothing. I tell you, I thank God. I love all people. I, I don't see no color. But the first day, praise God. Praise God. <laughs> I look at people through the eyes of Jesus. I don't see no color. I see souls. I'm so hungry. Oh, I'm so hungry. You hear me? I want souls. I want souls. I want souls for the kingdom of God. Woo! Glory to God. Praise God. Praise God. All God wants is a yielded vessel. Honey, when I died, I ain't never been the same. I died. You see, I used to love to play basketball. I used to love to fish. God burnt every earthly desire out of my heart. You hear me? I don't love to do nothing now but pray and cast out devils and heal the sick. Glory to God. Huh? That's my pleasure. Honey, when I caught the devil out of a person or see God heal cancer, that's greater than any basketball game I ever played. Woo! All right. Woo! I still have pleasure. I still have fun. My pleasure is seeing a sick heal. My pleasure is seeing a rank sinner come to God and repent. 
That's my pleasure, honey. I don't live for nothing else but that. But I'm gonna tell you, charity, charity, that's an anointed young lady. That song, I played that tape at the boys' home. Them two men right there are counselors at the bad boys' home in Clarksville, Tennessee. I preached there on Tuesdays. I played that tape. And when Charity began to sing under the anointing, tears began to roll in them cold hearts. They began to weep. One of the counselors got up and ran out, just weeping, because she didn't want to weep in front of the kids. Continue to use her in Jesus' mighty name. I got to be back. <laughs> I'll be back. I love y'all. I know there ain't no color. I understand that. We, we, we colorblind here too, brother. We don't see no color. Hey, listen, never have. Never have. That's honest to God truth. But what you think about that white boy playing that keyboard? Looks strange, but I love him. Brother Steve, I'll give you a nickel to let me preach this morning. I feel his thing. <laughs> I feel his thing. <laughs> now, it's a joke. I told him I'd give him a nickel to let me preach this morning. I feel his thing. <laughs> you give me that nickel. It's my Sunday. My you give me that nickel, bro. <laughs> We love you, man. God bless you. <laughs> Ain't nobody going to take my Sunday from me. Ooh. Hallelujah. Well, it's time to preach. Sister Diane, I was going to have you say a word, but he took your time. Can you say something in two minutes? Hallelujah. Well, I want to say that we're in practice for angel movements around here. I figured it out last night. Somebody asked me what it was. What are all these manifestations? If we had a body that moves like angels move, we don't know what kind of contortions we'd be in. But because we're limited, we can only move this way and that way. When we go making other movements, it gets weird, you know. So who knows? But what angels do this all the time? I know they fall down. I know they do that part of it. So how do we don't know? They don't do this every once in a while and that once in a while. You know, because they don't have a limitation of what to <laughs> or shoot their arrows or whatever they do. But I thank God. I thank God for what he's doing. And let me say, when the river starts flowing, the first thing that comes up is all the drudge and the junk and the crud in the bottom. And if the pastor isn't careful, when that happens, he'll shut it down right there. Say, Lord, we never had this much trouble before the move came. Yeah. You know, and, and you think that you're going to get out of it if you back down the other way. But the problems are worse instead of better. Yeah. The only way to do it when you get committed is just stay committed and move right on through it. Yeah. Just, just, just bulldoze through it. Let everything else come and go. For after a while, the rubbish is going to clear away and all the drudge is going to be gone and you're going to be left with a wider bank than you ever had and pure water than you ever drank because God's got a river that's flowing and the streams whereof will make glad the city of God. And I'm starting to drink. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Everybody just hold on to your seat because I'm going to be letting you go here sometime this afternoon. <laughs> it's 12 o'clock, and I promise you I'm not going to hold you no longer than I have to. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. I promise I'm not going to hold you long. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. I want you to look at verse 18. There's no service tonight. That's why we go long on Sunday morning. We're going to go till we get through. We've already had our altar call. We've got something special planned for the end of the service, so don't leave, whatever you do. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse 18. I love this passage of Scripture. I'm preaching this morning, friends. Everybody standing, please, for the reading of the Word. I'm preaching this morning on the subject, Are You One of Them? I want to ask you, are you one of them? People says, Brother Kilpatrick, man, 
there's some strange stuff going on in the church. I just want to say it's all right because God's in the house. And I also want to say to you, <clears throat> there's always been strange stuff going on in the, among the people of God. If you look real close at the scripture, you'll find in verse 18, the Bible said, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. I want everybody to look this way. The preaching of the cross to them that are lost, the Bible said to them that perish, it's foolishness. There may be some in here this morning that might be looking at us up here having all these people on the platform and we're happy and we're dancing around and we're rejoicing and the joy of the Lord is here. You might be looking up here and saying, oh, that's just a bunch of foolishness. You may be perishing too, friend. You may be perishing. But the Bible said, unto us that are saved, it is the power of God. Verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness are preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because look at verse 25 and 26, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Say amen. amen. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Say amen. amen. And the base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen, yea, the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Why? Verse 29, that no flesh, that no flesh, say it, no flesh, <laughs> that no flesh should glory in God's presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. Go to John chapter number 10, just two or three verses. John chapter number 10. Look at verse 19. I like this verse of scripture right here. How many of you know when there's a move of God, there's going to be a division? Y'all going to have to help me out this morning, folks. <clears throat> I said, y'all going to have to help me out. Don't you get lazy on me right now. It's too important. We're fixing to have a good time. John chapter 10, verse 19. There was a division. Therefore, again, among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said... He has a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, these are not the words of him that has a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? I want to read that one more time. Verse 19, there was a division therefore again among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said, he has a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, These are not the words of him that has the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Lord, add your blessings to the reading of the word. You may be seated. Friend, I want to tell you this morning in all of classical Christianity, 
There has never been a man like unto Jesus, which is called the Christ. At the same time, I am equally convinced that within the whole of human history, there has similarly never been a man whose life and ministry, whose words and deeds and whose message and motive were more maligned, misinterpreted, and misunderstood than this same man called Jesus. Scholars have debated him. Intellectuals have studied him. Skeptics have denied him. Philosophers have devised grand schemes to discount him. Wars have been fought because of him. Kings and kingdoms have known their rise and fall because of him. Anthems and oratorios have been sung to extol him. Cathedrals have been erected to exalt him, while still others hate him, rebuke him, and reject him. But the abiding truth remains that within the whole of human history, there has never been a man like Jesus called the Christ. I just read to you a while ago the scripture out of Corinthians that says not many wise, not many noble are called. I don't understand that. I don't really understand the world. I don't understand the mystic power that there is in the world that makes people like they are. I don't understand the line of demarcation that is drawn between the spirit of the world and the spirit of God. It seems like because we're of this world, maybe we are of it, but yet we're in the world, but not of it. Maybe the world has rubbed off on us so much that we have forgotten what it means to be one of God's. And I want to say, and I want to clear up right now at the very beginning before I move on much further, that I don't understand why God does not call people like we think he ought to call. I don't understand why the gifts flow through people that we wouldn't choose the gifts to flow through. But it seems like that God chooses the base and the out of the ordinary and the humble and a lot of times the ignorant and the uneducated to work through. And I'm certainly not saying this morning by getting started that the only people that God can use are those without degrees, are the ignorant, are the unlearned, are the low class. That's not the people that I'm saying that they're the only ones that God can use, and God does use some of them. God uses people, whoever they are, that will come to him in a spirit of humility. But I don't know why it is that God has chosen to use the kind of people that he uses and to use the kinds of things that he uses. But if you're going after the noble things, you're usually going away from God. And usually if you're going after the pretty things and the status things, you're leaving God. I just want to go ahead and tell you that. Down through the years, we Pentecostals have always had a name of being the church on the other side of the track. And it seems like when we was on the other side of the track, we had the power of God with us. But we looked on the other side of the track, and the grass looked so good and so fertilized and so green, and it looked so acceptable on the other side of the tracks that we started yearning to get churches on the other side of the tracks so we could start influencing and drawing a different caliber of people. And once we started drawing a different caliber of people, we started seemingly losing our anointing because we wanted to dress the church up with nice-looking people, educated people, intellectual people, and people of influence and status. And it seemed like from the very time we started doing that, we started losing the anointing and the signs and the wonders. 
I think that there is a good balance between the both. I don't think we have to go back on the other side of the tracks. I believe that God wants us to have nice buildings. But as you can tell, this building here is not on the other side of the tracks. And I don't have anything against churches that do have churches on the interstates or in nice metropolitan areas or nice residential urban neighborhoods. I don't have a problem with that. But the Lord spoke to my heart and said, leave this church where it is because I'm going to make it a lighthouse. Don't move it. And because we've left this church, God has chosen to pour out his glory in this place. I believe you can have a nice building and still have the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And I believe that you can still have educated people and people that have degrees and people of status if those people realize that they can't go after the world, they've got to go after God. And there's a lot of people in the world today that are lawyers and doctors, and God saved them and he placed them in the church, and they realize they can't associate with that circle of friends like they used to have in the world because there's nothing there. How many of you knows it's sterile out there? But God has saved people from that world and brought them in the church and put them in a fertile environment, and they're happy there. Because in this church, you may find a garbage worker sitting next to a lawyer. You may find a maid that cleans a motel room sitting next to a doctor and his wife. You may find an oriental sitting next to a black, and you may find a black sitting next to a white. I believe that's the way it ought to be in the things of God. Can you say amen? John, the Bible tells us in chapter 10 and verse 20, it said, many of them said, he has a devil and is mad. Why do you hear him? When you look at Jesus closely, and I want this to bring hope to some of you this morning, and I want you to listen. The way I'm fixing to take, you might not understand, but just hang with me for a little while. When you look at Jesus and study him closely, you can begin to see why there were those that said Jesus was strange. Because there was something strange about those that Jesus had daily contact with. Jesus did not go after the wise boys according to the wisdom of this world. Matter of fact, he always tangled with them. And if you don't want to get in a tangle with Jesus, go after God in a spirit of humility and forget the wisdom of this world. You know, one of the things that troubles me greatly today, and it troubled me before revival broke out, and listen, I've been to college, so I don't have a problem with it. I've been, a, I've been to college. I enjoyed it. I had to work a job while I was in college, and so did my wife. I enjoyed it, but God took me out of college and placed me in the full-time pastoral ministry. But one of the things that bothered me so much is that I would hear people get together and talk about how that their child graduated from the university of so-and-so and from this college and there was a lot of bragging going on and a lot of pride. And it's good to be proud of your children. I'm proud of my children. But it seemed like that we began to look at the world with an affinity. And we began to look at the world with almost an awe and such an attraction and a lust toward the world that when our kid went to a secular university and got a degree from a university, and then they came back in the church, we held them up and said we're so proud of them and we bragged about the degree that they got but not really realizing sometime that that degree came from ungodly professors that taught them to hate God and taught them to renounce the power of God and taught them to renounce the way they were raised, especially even in a Pentecostal church. But yet we turned from those things and we looked at that degree and we were proud that we had a symbol of the world that we could hold up as a trophy and say look what my son did or look what my daughter did not even realizing all the time that as we were doing those kinds of things, we were losing more and more of the anointing, and there was a hole poked in us, and we began to leak out something precious. When we were little in our own eyes, and we were humble in our own sight, God could use us. But somewhere down the line, we lost that humility in our own eyes, and we began to try to impress the world, and we lost the anointing. You begin to study the life of Jesus Jesus was strange. There were those that said Jesus was strange, and I guarantee you he gave them reason to say that he was strange. There's people that say about us at this revival, they're strange. 
Because you see, after church on weeknights, whenever the service is over, people go up to the kettle and they go up to the Waffle House and go up to Shoney's and they have to help them in there to get them in the restaurant. And then when they get them in the restaurant, they can't even eat their food after somebody else has ordered for them. And the waitresses come by and sees them at the table shaking under the power of God and they say, we're strange. I confess, we're strange. Friend, let it go down in the annals and the history records of this church. In 1996, Brownsville Assembly turned strange. And I'm glad to say I am one of them. Let's look at Jesus for just a few moments. Jesus made a habit of hanging around mad folks. You should have seen that man Jesus went to hear preach one day. He left the city, and he went out into the wilderness. There was a man down there standing in the water, dressed like a caveman. And the Bible said he had on camel skins from Saks Fifth Avenue, <laughs> and his diet was honey and locusts. That's a strange man, friend. <laughs> and Jesus left the city and went out to hear this evangelist. And the man was standing down in the water, and there was people up on both sides of the bank of the river. And the man was out there like a wild man. He reminded me of an evangelist I know. <clears throat> and that man was standing down there in the river with camel skin on and some dried honey in the corner of his mouth and a locust wing stuck on the side of his mustache. And he was standing down in the water and he was saying, Repent! Repent! For the kingdom of God is at hand. And there was a little girl singing over a megaphone, Come run into the mercy seat. And then the evangelist in the water would holler out, Come on, you pond slime! Come on! You ain't nothing but pond slime, friend. Get off that bank and get down in this water and get baptized. Come on now. And the crowd crawled down in the water. And John baptized as the sweat was rolling off of him, dunking people down in the water by the scores and by the hundreds. And Jesus, people looked around and saw him there in that crowd. And friend, I want to tell you, you may have decided that you was going to fly to Pensacola anonymously. But I want to tell you, we got cameras up here on the platform. We got cameras up in the balcony. And everybody's picture has already been taken, so you're dead meat already. This is going to go out on videos all over the country, so if you came anonymously, I want to tell you you're not anonymous anymore. You are one of us already. And people, people turned and they looked and they just, they had heard of this Galilean. They had heard of this man from Nazareth. He was different. And everybody was getting in the water and getting baptized, and I'm sure they were beginning to whisper, I wonder what he's doing here. I wonder what he's doing here. And in just a minute, he waited until the last person was baptized, and then after they all were baptized, and John was pouring wet with sweat, water all over him, looking like a wild caveman, Jesus walked down in the water to him. And when Jesus walked down in the water to him, he said to him, would you please baptize me? And John looked up at him, and this was graceful and humble of John to say it, but he said, I am not worthy to unloose the latchets of your shoes, your sandals. You baptize me. Jesus said, no, you baptize me. John said, I must decrease, but he must increase. And the Bible said that John dunked him under the water and held him and brought him back up. And rumor has it, 
when he came back up, people said they heard a voice. Some people standing by said they thought it thundered. Others were standing close enough by that they heard a voice. You know, Pentecostals are strange folks. They're always claiming to hear voices. Somebody standing close enough by said they heard a voice that said, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But they turned and looked, and there wasn't a soul there. And about that time, a bird came and lit on him. And Jesus left that pond and walked back toward Nazareth and walked back toward the place where he came from. And word was out, Jesus is mad. Jesus is strange. He had a habit of hanging around crazy people. They tell me he left a banquet one day where they was having a great time of laughter and wonderful time of fellowship. And he made his way across the Sea of Galilee into a little country called Gadara. Now the report has it that Jesus got out of the boat and didn't go anywhere else but the cemetery. And when he walked into the cemetery, report has it that he walked up to this man that was naked, didn't have on a stitch of clothes, and the man was so crazy he didn't even know his name. And Jesus walked up to him and sat down and started having a conversation with him. Jesus is strange, friend. Somebody help me. I said, Jesus is strange. Jesus asked him his name, and the man couldn't even respond. He was so wild-eyed. Jesus discerned right off what his name was, and he said, your name is Legion. And the devil spoke out and said, yes, we're Legion for we are many. And it tells us that Jesus spoke to those demons that was in him and commanded that they go into the pigs, and the pigs ran down in the water and drowned. And rumor has it, just a little bit, that man was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and hugging Jesus' calves and his ankles and looking lovingly into his eyes. And the report got back, that's the kind of people that Jesus was hanging around. Report has it that Jesus was found out in broad daylight one day with a harlot. sitting out there having an intimate conversation with her. While he was out there talking to her, some of the people began to gaze and some of the old biddies began to gaze and look at him. They saw him sitting out there with a harlot. Everybody knew she'd been married four or five times, and even the man she was living with wasn't her husband. And Jesus is sitting out there by the well with her, looking lovingly in her eyes, and she's looking lovingly in his eyes. And they're having an intimate conversation. And she was so moved by her time with Jesus that she went running back in the city and said, come and see a man. And boy, don't you know word got out. Word got out about the kind of people Jesus hung with and about how he affected them. He really had an effect on the women. As a matter of fact, Mary... Everybody knows about her. And then Jesus one time even let a woman come in that was known to be a harlot. And she broke open a box, expensive ointment, and bathed his feet and took her hair. And the man sat there and let her take her hair, knowing she was a harlot, and dry his feet with her hair. The man's mad, friend, I'm telling you. That's the kind of people that Jesus hung around. And if that doesn't make it strange enough, Rumor had it that he came from the womb of a teenage girl that had never known a man. You tell me if that's not strange. A teenage girl, he came from her womb, and she said that she had never had sexual relations and yet he claimed to be on the earth, came from her womb, from the own girl's mouth that said she never had sexual relations, and yet he wanted credibility. Jesus was strange. And not only that, 
Bible tells us that he went into the wilderness one time and stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights. And the report is he had a conversation with the devil. Now, can you imagine a man leaving the comforts of being around friends and others, family, and going into the wilderness and staying 40 days and 40 nights and not eating a bite and not drinking anything? And then after 40 days and 40 nights, he has a conversation with the devil. And rumor even has it that the devil, now get a load of this, folks, the devil even picked him up and carried him up on the pinnacle of the temple. And rumor has it this man thought so much of himself that the devil said, if you'll just worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. Jesus was strange, friends. Come on, help me out. His preaching was so unorthodox. He went into the temple to preach. He opened up the Bible, and the Bible tells us whenever he opened up the Scripture and began to share, his message was so unreligious and so different than anything anybody had ever heard. He was so fanatical and so foreign to what anybody was used to hearing, whenever he opened up the scriptures and began to preach, they came and drove him out of church and wouldn't let him preach in the church again. Jesus was a strange man. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. It also tells us he was invited to a wedding, a big festive time. Now, you know, when you put money into a wedding, you want everything to go great. But Jesus went to the wedding and messed everything up because they ran out. The crowd was so big. It was such a festive occasion. The crowd was so thirsty, they ran out of wine. And Jesus stood up and called 12 scraggly men that looked like somebody that would attend that revival over there in Brownsville. He called 12 straggly men up and said, come here, boys. And Jesus said, take these water pots and go fill them with water. And the bride said, oh, my God. And the groom said to his ushers, y'all get ready. We may have to do something. <laughs> Jesus said to those 12 straggly disciples, go fill these pots with water. And when they filled them with water, they came back with them, strapped over their neck, and the water was jostling everywhere. And Jesus said, now take the ladle and go dip out, and when you do, it's going to be wine. And as they walked, they carried water. When they stuck the water, the ladle into the water, it was still water, but by the time it hit their glasses, it had turned into wine. <laughs> Friend, listen to me. Jesus was strange. I'm telling you, the man was mad, and there was division about who he was and what he was doing. And don't forget, <laughs> well, this beats anything I've ever seen. Don't forget, Jesus was the one who thought he could walk on water. He got out there, they said, in the middle of a storm, and the disciples were scared out of their mind, and some said that it was a vision, and I believe that may have been what it was, because no man can walk on water. And they saw Jesus coming to them in the storm, walking on the water, and Peter said, oh my God, it's a sign of things to come. We're going to die. And Jesus walked up to the boat on the water, they said, and said to Peter, why don't you come out here and join me? And Peter hopped out of the boat and tried it, and they said he could do it for a few minutes, but that was just mind over matter. Jesus was strange. Jesus was strange. You know that no man can walk on water, and no man can give the ability and the power to another man to walk on water. He's mad. No wonder there was a division in the church in the early days of the church when Jesus was here. But now, the final straw was in a meeting with the scribes and the Pharisees. 
These were the ones, the scribes and the Pharisees, were the ones who meditated day and night on the law. They were the ones that knew the law. They were the ones that interpreted it, they wrote it, they carried it, they were in charge of it. And Jesus came and he made this statement, and this was the most absurd of all, in the presence of those scribes and Pharisees that love the Old Testament and love David, Jesus stood up in the presence of those men that carried the Holy Writ, and he said, I am the Good Shepherd. And the scribes and the Pharisees, that was more than they could take because, you see, they were the ones that carried under their arms in the scrolls that scripture in Psalms 23 where it says, David said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And here, this Galilean that said he could walk on the water, he's found talking to a prostitute. His birth was under unusual circumstances. Here he is now saying that he is the good shepherd. He's mad. He's strange. Jesus also talking to these elitist Jews, and the Jews felt like they were the only ones. They felt like everybody else was excluded. Jesus said to these elitist Jews, and I want to tell you something else, men, he said, you're not the only ones either. He said, because you see, my father has sheep that is not of this fold. And the Jews said, <gasps> blasphemy. We are the people of God. We are the chosen people of God, and there's nobody else. But Jesus stood there like a madman and said, my father has sheep that's not of this pasture and I have come to graft them in. You know who those sheep were? The Gentiles and that's you and I. <laughs> Jesus also made another claim. He said, I lay down my life for the sheep and no man takes it from me. I lay it down and I take it up. I have the power to lay my life down. I have the power to take up my life. And to prove that, Jesus raised someone from the dead, and oh my, the rumors really began to fly. They said he even put some people out of the room that was mourning. They said that he allegedly raised his friend from the dead, but evidently it was a staged plot because no man can raise anybody from the dead. This man is absolutely out of his mind. And then he said in John chapter 9, I am the light of the world. And to prove that, he allegedly pulled a blind man over and healed him of his blindness. And you know what he did? You know how he did it? He didn't go down to the apothecary and get an eyedropper, and he didn't get some clean gauze. He reached down and took some dirt off the ground and said, <laughs> and he spit in his old carpenter's hands that was rugged from working in his daddy's carpenter shop. He didn't even have a college degree. And Jesus took some dirt and spit in it and stirred the spit up in the dirt and said to the man, come here. And he took the spit and said, now, he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the pool of Siloam was a dirty pool. Jesus could have told him, at least go wash under the hydrant. He's a strange man, friend. Jesus is strange. Yes. And the Bible said that the man came back seeing, and the scribes and the Pharisees called him together, and they said to the man, his parents, they said, was this man born blind? And the people said, the parents said, yes, he was born blind. But they said, I tell you what you do. Don't talk to us about him. He's of age. Ask him. And the Bible said right there before the man could even answer, there was a great division among them because they didn't know how he did what he did. 
Some said he had a devil. Others said he was the son of God. And then they called the man forward and they said to the man, what happened to you? How did you get your sight back? He said, I tell you this, whether he's a devil or not, I don't know. All I can say is, I once was blind, but now I can see. I once was blind, but now I can see. Friend, I want to tell you something about the Son of God. He's giving sight back to at least 45,000 people all over this nation that once was blind, but now they can see. The Bible said there was a division among them. Evidently, he was mad. They said he's got a devil. But now Jesus really blows it whenever he said this. He said to those exclusive Jews, you see, they specialized in shutting people out. And I want to say this to you this morning. Religious people always specialize in shutting others out. Religious people specialize in shutting out people that don't look like them, act like them, smell like them, and look like them. And these elitist Jews heard Jesus say, I am the door. And when he said that, they knew they were in trouble. They said, he's mad, he's gone crazy. He not only said, I am the door, but he said this. He said, I am the only door. And he said, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to open up this exclusive club of yours, and we're going to move it from Jews only to Samaritans and the Gentiles and to the dogs. Because you see, they call the Samaritans dogs. And Jesus said, I'm going to receive dogs through my door, and they're free to come. And I'm going to receive the Gentiles that you've never liked and never loved. They can come through me to the Father, and they can get forgiveness from, from me through the Father, and I'm going to lead them to heaven, and I'm going to take them with me to glory. And the Jews grabbed their chest and fell back and said, He is absolutely crazy. Amen. And then finally, I'm about to change the subject. Finally, Jesus said, not only that, but he said, I have come that they might have life. Do you know what it means to have life? You see, before Jesus came, the political circles of his day, all it was was a grind. Getting up in the morning, working, coming home, doing chores, going to bed, working, doing chores, caring for the family, going to bed, getting up, same routine, day after day after day after day. Jesus came and he said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. What Jesus was saying is, I have come that you might have a purpose and that you might have a reason for living. When the devil wades in on you and beats you up and tells you you're no good and you're never going to make it and nobody loves you and nobody cares for you, Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundant. Hallelujah. They could not understand how a man could stand up and tell people that had no life that he was going to give them a life. Then he said, and this is really what did it, he said, I am the resurrection, and I am the life. Jesus said, I have come to show you the way and to take you to a city, a city of God. He said, I know the way. Nobody else knows the way, but he said, I know the way to the city of God. And he said, this city is gleaming. It's beautiful. It's powerful. And he said, it's a city where there's no more death, no more dying, no more grief, no more pain, no more midnights, no more valleys, no more mountains, no more temptations, no more trials. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, and if any man will believe in me, he shall never die. 
And the disciples heard that, and they admired Jesus. And certain of the Jews heard that and said, he can't have a devil. He has to be from God. But others said, no, he's mad, and don't hear him. And I told you all that to share this. And this is the meat of my message. As it was then, so it is today. As it was then, so it is today. Friend, pastors, I want you to hear me. If Jesus hung around the prostitutes, who says that we are to segregate ourselves away from the prostitutes? If Jesus hung out around all colors and all races and all nationalities that people of his day said were dogs and scum and Gentiles and not worthy to be taken in, who says that we're not to begin to hang around people of the whole world and love them and take them in into the kingdom of God? If Jesus' birth was questionable, I've got good news for those of you that came from an illegitimate childhood. I've got good news to tell you, friend, Jesus was not illegitimate. His father was the Holy Ghost, and the Virgin Mary was his mother, but he was accused of it. The Bible said he is able to succor them that are tempted because he has likewise gone through everything that a human being can go through. Yeah. And if you have a bad name of coming from the other side of the tracks, or your mother had a bad name, or your dad had a bad name, I want to tell you the grace of God can save you and lift you up and plant your feet on higher ground. Jesus was not mad or crazy. My friend, let me tell you something this morning. They said that he was crazy. They said he was mad, and it caused a division. I just want to get one thing straight while this is on my mind and on my heart. Let me go ahead and say it. Y'all help me out a little bit. People are afraid of revival. Because they said, dear God, if revival comes, it's going to split the church. I say split it right down the middle. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. There may be people sometime I feel the snobs snubbing me. I can even feel people at times in my own congregation when revival first broke out giving me that icy stare like, you're changed, Brother Kilpatrick. You're not the same man. I can feel that glare of that self-righteous spirit that holier-than-thou attitude that says he's gone mad, he's gone crazy, and he's let the whole church go crazy, and just look at this revival crowd that's coming. Look at this. The whole church is filled with crazies. I just want to say to you, friend, if they call Jesus mad, and he was the spotless, sinless son of God, they're going to call you mad too. I tell you the ones that's mad, and I tell you the ones that's crazy, it's the ones that comes and sits in the midst of revival, while the glory cloud is falling, while the power of God is moving, while bodies are being healed and souls are being saved, and they sit there and look down their long, snooty noses and judge everything, you're the crazy one. You're the crazy one. You're the 
service like this where the healing virtue of Calvary is flowing who wouldn't want to be in a service like this where Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father overseeing his healing blood and he's pouring it out in Pensacola man listen to me you're crazy for not letting your umbrella down and letting the healing rain fall on your head you're crazy I tell you what, somebody else may say, but oh, I tell you, I'm just such a shame to go to such an ignorant and an unlearned church. Well, I tell you something, friend, I feel like I'm in good company. Because the Bible tells us that the disciples were not learned, they were not intellectuals, and they were not wise according to this world. Paul said, I don't come to you with the wisdom of man's speech, but I come to you with a demonstration of the power of God. So I'll tell you something. If there's a choice, if I have a multiple choice, and it's miracles and signs and wonders according to the flow of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, or if it's according to man's wisdom, I'll take miracles and signs and wonders according to the power of the Holy Ghost. If they think Jesus was crazy, let's just go ahead and say it. They might as well go ahead and say the same thing about all of us, for he's the head and we are the body. I tell you what, I want to go ahead and go on record this morning and say this. If he was crazy, let it be known, I'm crazy too. Let it be known, if he was crazy, let it go on record, the evangelist is as crazy as Jesus. Let it go on record that if Jesus was crazy, Brenda, my wife, is crazy as Jesus is. Because night after night, including last night, she was so deep under the glory of God after some woman prayed for her that she didn't come to until after we got home. She couldn't even talk. I pulled up to Whataburger to order. And I ordered a hamburger, and I ordered me a Coke, and the woman leaned out the window and looked at me, and she said, can I help you, sir? And I said, yeah. I said, Brenda, do you want anything? <laughs> Brenda, do you want anything? She's out of here, brother. I know that waitress thought, boy, they've been to some more party tonight. <laughs> But friend, let me tell you, we weren't at a party. We was at a pre-wedding ceremony. <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo. Hallelujah. at a practice wedding and a practice party and a practice reception and she had drunk from some of that wine them disciples had served at that wedding in Cana Galilee it had turned from a river into a river of fresh new wine the best wine and I know when the world looks at us you see while we're in this environment here in the church we're having a great time. We're whooping it up. We're singing. We're twirling. We're dancing. Man, we're just having the time of our life. And when we walk out those doors out trying to crank up our car, there's a secular world out there we got to go back and face. 
And all of a sudden, the devil will start talking to you, and he'll say things like this. You really don't believe that mess, do you? You really don't believe that people come in there and shake like that on the power of God. Do you? That's put on less emotionalism. You don't really believe that, do you? You don't really believe that those pre preachers go around there and then prayer workers go around there laying hands on folks and they fall out and fall down in the aisle and shake and carry on and convulse. You don't really believe that's God, do you? That secular world out there and that environment of the world which has the wisdom of the world will look at this and say, that is such low class. I tell you what that is, that's demonic. They said in John 10 and 20, he's mad, he has a devil. If they said it about him, they're going to say it about us. Friend, listen, it's a compliment for somebody to say, they've gone, the devil's got a hold of it. Somebody said when this thing first broke out, they said, I'll tell you how that thing broke out over yonder at Brownsville. I'll tell you how it broke out. Kill Patrick. Steve put a spell on him. That's what they said. They said that he'll put a spell on kill. <clears throat> and when Hill put the spell on kill, he put him out where the church was vulnerable and the pastor was down and couldn't move. And so the devil came in and run roughshod over the whole place. But what they forgot to understand is, I'm the underling, I'm the earthly shepherd, but there's a head shepherd, and his name is Jesus. And he has the guidance and the oversight of the flock of the living God. And friend, when you walk out of there in that secular world, that world will tell you, the educators will tell you, the high school teachers, the junior high school teachers, the professors in college, they will all tell you that's a bunch of bunk, it's mind control, it's emotionalism. But I want to stand here before you today and I want to say this. This is that. is that this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel in the last days he said in the last days I'll pour out my spirit give me this microphone man in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. <laughs> Somebody said, I can't believe that parents will go over there to that church and let their kids go to that revival and all that demon stuff going on. But let me finish the prophecy of Joel. I will pour out my spirit in those days, saith the Lord, upon all flesh, your sons. <laughs> Woo! And your daughters. Your young men and your old men and upon my handmaid saith the Lord will I pour out my spirit Woo! and you see the thing he's going to pour out his spirit on is not your spirit but the thing that's been so worldly and secularized he said I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh flesh friend listen my problem is not my spirit my spirit loves God it's on fire it's born again where I have my problem is the flesh the natural mind when I'm in this church service and I'm rejoicing it's wonderful I'm gonna go ahead and just let my hair down and don't you laugh bless God sit down I'll call for you in a minute, Linda. I'm just getting warmed up, brother. Amen. <laughs> when I'm off, and which is not often, because I'm out every other Monday and Tuesday somewhere, but whenever I am off on Monday, 
You might say, oh, Brother Kilpatrick, don't you love that time when you're off? It's all right. But I love this move of God so much. When I'm not here, I'd rather be here sitting in my chair and hear the evangelist give an altar call and seeing those souls come running to the mercy seat. I'd rather be here and hear Brother Lindell up behind that microphone singing with the glory of God in his vocal cords and the worship team lifting him up and extolling and magnifying the name of Jesus. Because you see, when I'm off, that world is pulling at me out there and that world is talking in my ear and the devil's on my shoulder. But when I'm in this church, there ain't no devil within five miles radius of Brownsville Assembly of God. I love this church. Before God poured out revival in this church, I used to tell my wife, I said, honey, there's such a spirit down there at Brownsville now. In my prayer time, I think I may just take my sleeping bag up there and spend the night in the church one Saturday night and not even leave and come home, but just get up and go back in the lounge and clean up and go in and preach. That's how strong the glory of God was. You see, if Jesus were here right now, he'd be right at home in this revival. If John Wesley were here right now, he'd be right at home in this revival. If George Whitfield was here, he'd be right at home in this revival. But you can leave and get in your car and travel less than a mile. And that secular world out there with its wisdom and with its abrasiveness can make you doubt in less than five minutes after you leave this parking lot everything you experienced the last several hours. It's a horrible place out there, friend, that world. And what killed and damned our church was whenever the church began to flirt with the world and try to attract the world. And the world began to come in and darkness began to come through the cracks of the doors and sit in our pews, and we lost the anointing. But I got good news for you, friend. Darkness is gone. Darkness is gone. Let me say one more thing, and I'll close. I don't know about everything. I don't know how long it's going to go. I don't know about this revival. I love it so much. It's turned my life upside down. It's wonderful, most wonderful thing I've ever experienced. And some of you people that can't come, except just on Sunday mornings, you just get to come one time a week. Let me just tell you something. When you come in here on that one time a week, and I love you for it, bless your little hearts. I know you can't come and stand in line like other people have all during the summer. I know you can't. But whenever you come in here, just remember one thing. Don't come in with a judgmental spirit because you hadn't been here all week. And you hadn't been in the glory and you hadn't been in the power. Many of you hadn't even been able to come in the church. And so that worldly spirit will grab a hold of you again. When you first walk in, it may take you 30 minutes to get acclimated again to the glory of God after being out of it all week. And after about 30, 40 minutes, then you begin to feel at home again. But at first, everything seems so strange because you've had that pollution of the world on you all week long. And it may take you a while to get acclimated again to the glory of God. And I just want to say this to you, friends. Heaven's going to be wonderful because in heaven, it's going to be glory all the time. And here's the final thing I want to say. If Jesus was crazy... We all are crazy. And here's why. Because he said, my sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice. If I'm crazy, it takes a crazy person to know my voice. But I want to tell you something, friend. This world is so crazy that when the truth and the way and the life comes, the world says it's mad. Don't be surprised when you go back at your secretarial pool if they don't look at you and call you crazy. Don't be surprised if they start attacking your pastor and saying, I heard you used to have a decent pastor. I used to watch him on television. And, oh, he used to feed my soul. But now, my God, he runs and dances. He's lost his mind. You just look at them and say, yes, and I've lost mine too because I run right in behind him. <laughs> Let me tell you something else. <clears throat> Come here, John Michael. Come here, baby. 
My boy's here today. He's not on the road. This boy's been preaching the gospel all over the country, folks. <clears throat> I want you to tell him about your friend that came up here the other night and got saved. Tell him a story. Preach it, boy. Well, uh, my friend, uh, I played high school basketball in, in high school, and uh, <coughs> my friend, uh, he, he was a superstar. He played for Tate High School. And so, uh, you know, we, we were in the basketball arena together, and I had seen him. And uh, so, so uh, I seen him last night. I came in here in the sanctuary, and I seen him. I said, good Lord, what are you doing here, man? He says, well, you know. I heard about what was going on, and uh, my cousin had told me about revival and everything, so uh, he came, and, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> I see all these people, good Lord. <laughs> you got you to gotta, you gotta give me a break. Uh, a break man. Anyway, <laughs> what he was saying is, I'll, I'll help you out here and get your breath. I know I surprised you. It's all right. But he said this big old boy came in here, and he saw him Friday night, and, and he was a superstar. He's a big player, you know, and John Michael went up to him. He said, what are you doing here? He said, well, I've been hearing about the revival. Didn't he say I've been hearing about the revival? Yeah. yeah. I'm better now. Right. Uh, but anyway, he came in, and he, uh, I talked to him, and uh, he said, yeah, I've been hearing about what's going on in revival. So I went in the back. And I came back during an altar call, and I seen him at the altar, and uh, he, was, he was just crying and everything. And uh, that's the magnitude of this revival. People don't realize what's going on because you're not really here, but, and the people that are here, but you just don't realize the magnitude of this revival. All these souls that are coming down, we're not making up 45,000 souls, okay? These people, this guy, I known him in high school. He was messed up on drugs. For all his life, his dad left him, and he's had a messed up life. And he came in here, and he found hope at the altar. And he was crying, crying. And uh, I talked to him. I talked to him, and he said, man, he said, I, find, he said, I came to my end. He said, all the drugs, all the alcohol. He, and I'd hear, I'd hear my friends talk about him. He said he, he would be in fights at parties. He had busted knuckles every weekend. A messed up guy, never felt love in his whole life. And he came down to these altars, received Jesus for the first time in his life. And he said he'll never be the same. And that's what's going on in this revival. Oh, his, uh, his family that brought him here, she, uh, he, he asked her. He, this, he had been hearing about revival, and all these people kept bugging him about revival. A lot of times we have people come in, they get bribed, they get all kind of things to come here, and then the power of God hits them and changes them. But anyway, uh, he asked his cousin, he said, have you, you know, have you heard about this revival? And she says, uh, she says, yeah, I've heard about it, but I hadn't been. Well, l l let's come, let's come. And... Uh, She, uh, she, she, she had lost her first two uh, children to birth, lost the first two babies, and uh, she's pregnant again. And so now she came at the altar, and he got Steve Hill's wife to pray for her, but she's believing God that she'll have her baby again. And uh, God's drawn people uh, for all kind of reasons, but the main thing in this revival is souls is souls. It's people uh, for the first time getting saved, drawing closer to Jesus and holiness. And uh, people just change lives, change lives. And uh, one more thing, uh, you know, uh, I don't mean to hog up this pulpit, but uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, this is my dad, and I've seen, uh, I've, you know, I knew everybody in our church before revival started. And now that revival started, I probably know 20% of these people. I don't know anybody. 80% of them I don't even know. But God's bringing them from all over the world and touching them. All right, man. Bless you. <clears throat> Let me tell you something else. These people, they're coming from all walks of life. And what I told Steve Friday night was this, and I close, I promise you. What I told, told Steve Friday night was, I said, you know what's so wonderful is to see these people come to the altar, and they come anonymously. You don't know who they are. But what I love about baptismal is when they hold the mic up there, they're not anonymous anymore. See? 
They come to the altar and they pray. You don't know who came and prayed. You don't know anything about their life. But when they put the microphone up there to their mouth in the baptismal pool and they start talking in the baptismal pool, they're not anonymous anymore. My name is so-and-so, so-and-so. I'm from so-and-so, so-and-so. I've been running from God for 26 years. I was, a har I, I was a harlot. I was messed up in my life. I've had man after man. I've been bound with drugs and alcohol. But now I found Jesus, and my life will never be the same. And I'm about to go under the water, and Jesus, I'll never turn back. They scream it in the microphone. And somebody sitting out there that just come in off the street would sit up there and look at that and say, they're crazy. Yes, we are. We are crazy friends. I want every crazy man and every crazy woman and every crazy young person to stand to your feet and praise the Lord. Remember how you felt when Jesus came down and he washed all those old dirty sins away. You know what? Every since that day, hallelujah, every since that day.
somewhere. I know it's there. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not going to keep you, but just another moment. It's raining cats and dogs outside, so you can't leave anyway. It's just pouring. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but anyway, I want to say one more thing to you. Listen, friend, I don't care anymore what people say. I remember before revival broke out, we had a real good service one Sunday night, and we had about 75 people baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was awesome Sunday night service. And I went out to a restaurant to eat, and, and a pastor of a big church came in. I'll never forget this. And uh, he walked up to me, and he said, Hey, Brother John. I said, Hey, man. Big church. And I said, uh, how, how? He said, How'd everything go tonight over there at Brownsville? I said, Oh, man, it was great. I said, Whew, the glory of the Lord came down. He looked at me like, What? I said, man, the glory of the Lord came down. I said, we had 75 people go through the baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. He just sort of meandered and walked away. So the next Sunday night, I went out to a restaurant, and sure enough, he came in again. And he walked up to me, and he hollered across the restaurant. He said, hey, John, how was church tonight? Did the glory fall? I said, yeah, 125 got the baptism tonight. Listen, when, when the Spirit of God is poured out in a place like this and God begins to do some of those strange things that people, when he was here on the earth, they called him mad, when he begins to do some of those things that they called him mad for among us here on the earth, there's going to be people that's going to leave our churches and go off to those other so-called sane churches, and they want to hide in them, and they don't want nothing to do with us. But I got news for those so-called sane churches. Revival's headed their way, too. And I got, I got news for you, too, friend. I would rather be in a church like this, no matter what the name was on the door or who the pastor was. I'd rather be in a church like this where the glory and the power is and where they call them crazy than to be in a church where they had no life and no power and no authority. Because, you see, you come to a church like this, if you're sick, you can get healed. And if you're a chief of sinners and bound by pornography and bound by drugs and bound by alcohol, you can get free, praise God. And you can come and sit and watch a service where a man gets up and talks about how just three days ago he was bound in fetters by the devil, but now he's free. You don't hear a lot of that in some of those other churches, friend. That's why they look at us and call us crazy and mad. And I just want to go on record before I dismiss, and I won't be back on this for a long time, I don't think, until maybe next Sunday. I just want to go on record and let it be said and let it be known. Yes, John Kilpatrick is crazy. And yes, Brownsville Assembly has gone mad, and I hope we never get sane again.
Different life. folks may doubt. Some folks may scorn. Some may desert me and leave me alone. I want some of our Brownsville people that's gone crazy with me. I want y'all to come up here and say a few words real quick. It's raining. You can't leave. So it's a good time to do it. I want some of my Brownsville people. Sister, uh, Sister Kaufman, you, I can tell you, you want to come. Where's some other Brownsville people that wants to talk about going crazy? Bill, you've gone slap crazy. Come on up here. Jeannie, come on up. You come up with him. Brother Trussell, you come up. You've gone slap crazy too, brother. Come on. Anybody in the choir want to, want to talk about going crazy? Anybody up here? Is anybody? Come on up here, Vicky. Anybody else up here in the choir? Wants, anybody else out in the audience want to talk about it? Some of our Brownsville people. Some of our old Brownsville people before revival broke out. Any of y'all want to talk? You can't leave. It's raining. Don't leave. It's raining. You're going to get wet. Lightning may strike you if you go out the door. Be careful. <laughs> All right. You have lost it. Take a minute. Come on over here. Helen, have you gone crazy? Yes. Why oh. have you gone crazy? Tell them about it. I just want more. Just I want more. Talk to I, them. What can we say? Jesus is Jesus, and I want more of Jesus. I want more of Jesus. What? What causes you and Joe to come out here every night? Y'all sitting right up there in the corner of the balcony. Y'all come up here every night. I see you up there on your knees waving your hands. I see Joe bent over. One night I saw Steve go by and pray for him, and I saw him hit the floor like he was a dead man. What, what's happened to y'all? We love it. We love Jesus. You, Jesus loves us. You love this revival? Yes, yes. I wouldn't change it for the world. What would you do if this revival ended? What, what, how would it affect you? I don't know. I don't know. It'd be tough, wouldn't it? Uh, I haven't, in my heart yet, I don't know the magnitude of this. We see such wonderful people. God has just brought people from everywhere. And they're wonderful and they love Jesus. How does it affect you when you see people come in here of all colors, all ranks, all different uh, backgrounds in life? Some people come in here dressed scantily. Some come in here smelling bad. As a member of a church... How does that how does that affect you when you see that kind of thing? It used to bother me, but I remember I can't remember whether it was you or Steve that said, "God didn't clean the fish before He caught them. He caught them and then He cleaned them." That's a good way to look at it. Yeah, Vicky, what has happened to you? I remember the time you was an activist and uh, had had a bad name in town already, been an activist, anti-abortion, and now you go around the church doing this. What's that all about? I'm a female David. And I thank God before revival, in all sincerity, I praise God for this man. And I don't say that to flatter him. I praise God 
that 10 years ago when we came to this church, we had finally found a church where there's a true shepherd. And I say that in, in humility to you. This man is a man of God. He's not paying me to say this. But before revival, we had a good church. This man preached the word. I first heard him on TV, and the first message I heard was laying the ax to the root. This man cut sin. There were, he didn't tolerate sin in this body. But there was religion in my life. God delivered me from religion. God broke those walls. It would have bothered me three years ago to have a homeless man. In fact, one time in the old sanctuary, a homeless man came up and he kissed me. Um, he was drunk and it bothered me. It's like, he doesn't belong here. But God has brought me full circle. They do belong here. The sinners belong here. But more importantly, the believers belong here because without the believers, without the body of Christ, without the Brownsville people, there won't continue to be revival. God needs all of us to continue to pray and intercede. This is my church, and I'm going to do warfare in this church. And my prayer is that any sinner, any wicked person, any evil person, any witch, any warlock, Anybody in the occult who comes here and thinks that they're going to take over this ground, you are deceived. You are crazy. The power of God is going to stay here. And, Pastor, I can't imagine what this church would be like without revival. I pray that it never comes to an end. But in order for that to happen, we have to stand up. We have to put on the armor of God. And we have to serve notice on Satan that everyone in this city is going to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Well, you well, watch this. Your arm flies out sometime. What's that all about? I'm, I'm fighting. <laughs> tell, tell everybody who this is. Tell everybody who that is. This is my wife, Jeannie. She's the coordinator for the prayer team. I'm the usher coordinator, and I'm having the time of my life. I had a very successful military career, and it seems that everything that I did in the military prepared me for the job that I'm in. <laughs> While I was standing there, the Holy Spirit reminded me of a dream that I had back in 1957 or 58, I don't remember exactly when. But it was a dream that I had that someday when I retired that I would have on a retreat and that I would entertain pastors from all over the country and that I would serve them meals, I'd have a cottage, uh, something of that nature. And Lord, has this dream come true. Uh, it is just incredible, the people that we meet phone calls that we get from all over the world, email, it's just absolutely incredible. Terry Appeal from Australia called me one morning at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, and he says, uh, what time is it there, brother? And I said, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. He says, I'll call you back in four, at, in four hours. So it is just absolutely incredible. I am having the time of my life. I feel the most fulfilled that I have ever felt of anything that I have ever done in my life. I feel the same way. At a time in my life, I would not like to have been called crazy. That would have sort of offended me. But since I've been in this revival and you're on this platform every night working, you don't care what people call you. And it's sort of fun being crazy, isn't it? <laughs> You want to say something? Lex, you're a quiet man. I didn't know you was up here. You're a quiet guy. I was in the balcony, and you didn't see me, so I came on down anyway. Oh, great. Tall, man. Okay. Tall. Um, I haven't really addressed you know, the revival crowd before. Uh, the only thing I've probably said is it's through the double doors and to the left. <laughs> or that she's over in the other building, because someone's always asking where Teresa is. But about a month ago, while I was on vacation, the Lord had given me a dream. I mean, I had a dream. I think once I tell you what it was about, you'll, you'll agree it was from the Lord. And it was basically seeing on one side like a, a double-story building with people out on a balcony uh, lifting their arms and praising the Lord. 
And on the other side of this road, it was just a mass of people, just like you see out here, but they were all coming to cross the road to go to the building where all the praising was going on. And I wasn't sure what I had seen other than it just, it just seemed strange. All these people were here, and here the people were praising, and there were some other things on the side, some, you know, some buildings and all, and I didn't know what all that meant. But I had to know the answer, so I sought, you know, sought the Lord. What, what is this? What are you showing me? And I probably should have prefaced this by saying, someone is always saying, is there lasting fruit? And this was my answer to, is there lasting fruit from this revival? And, and just as clear as if it were written or if someone were speaking to me, they said, this, there was a revival in this town 50 years ago. And these people have a hunger for the Lord, and they're running across the street to get into this house of worship 50 years after revival. And they're still hungering for the Lord, just like we see day after day after day. Pensacola isn't just touched for a season. It's touched for 50 years. Wow, that's powerful. Bob? He tickles me. He, uh, you, somebody, somebody will catch her. As an usher on duty right here, friend. Um, he tickles me how that God's using him to pray for people. He went to a church in Texas. While he was in Texas, God used him to pray for people there, and they was going down the Spirit, and he said, Pastor, it even works in Texas. <laughs> Talk to the people and tell them, what? man, when I saw you jump in this revival and jump in this river and start acting like you acted, I was shocked because I've been knowing you 14 years. <laughs> I've been knowing you 14 years. you never done nothing like that. What happened? I'm crazy, man. <laughs> no, you got to be crazy. Anybody come to church five and six days a week, <laughs> spend half the night, something wrong with them, man. They're crazy. But I'm just standing behind this lady here just now. That's what I've been doing for a year and a half. <laughs> and it's just fantastic, Pastor. It's, it's, it's just, I mean, you can't tell anyone. It's, it's just unreal. God bless you. you know, when revival first broke out, I'm saying this for the benefit of the pastors, I, I was worried about people. Dan and Lydia, y'all come up here too. Come here. I was worried about people like these folks right here that I got my arm around and Dan and Lydia. And they're our old-time Brownsville people. I was worried about how the people like that, because I knew revival was coming. I knew it was about to hit, and I was just wondering if they was going to, you know, go for it, because we love these people. These are our friends. They're not only just our parishioners, but they're our friends. We love them. And I was wondering, you know, are they going to get in the river? And, and when this all breaks forth, what's going to happen? But I'm so glad that my people got in this river and, and really joined in and, and became a part. Man, I've seen, I've seen God really touch you folks. You all work on the prayer team. And you love this revival, don't you? Talk about it. Tell, talk to these people. We just crazy and had a relapse what we've done. <laughs> you what? We crazy and had a relapse already. That's it. <laughs> Well, this is just the most wonderful thing I think that's ever happened. Um, God is just really moving. He's changed our lives. He's changed our schedules. He's changed our business. Uh, he's just, in, in, in any way that you can imagine, he has changed. I was reading in Ephesians the other day. It said we're no longer strangers or foreigners, and that's absolutely the truth. This church is just an open door to everybody, no matter where they come from. So we just feel privileged to be a part of it and to be able to minister to people. God bless you. This guy is the president of a steel company. And she's a real estate agent. And to be associated with a church like this where all this crazy stuff's going on, I know, I know people have linked you all to this revival. But you made up your mind you're going to stick with it, right? Yes, sir. Hi. Great, great. No matter what people say. How many of you have made up your mind no matter what people say you're going to stay with God? Yeah. Come here, babe. Friend, when you sit out there and people see you sitting there and your eyes are closed, you can't even get your eyes open and you're under the glory, do you ever wonder sometimes what people think, what people say? <laughs> well, when we came back from uh, Toronto, the Lord, when I went to Toronto uh, in 95 in February, and when I came back, Cheryl Seitler and I, stand up, Cheryl, that's my buddy, we flew up to Toronto, and uh, I was really touched up there. I had uh, a stronghold in my life that I couldn't get the victory over, and, and uh, the Lord broke a band off of my head. He broke a band off of my head, and when I came back, 
I really didn't know what the Lord had done for me, but he had just took that claw out of my brain, and I had such freedom. And I began to enter into a worship that I had never known and a love for the Lord that I had never had before and an intimacy that I had longed for and knew it was, didn't really know that was possible, but it, I was just brought in to a different level with the Lord, and, and I've been ever so grateful. But Cheryl and I, that day we came back, uh, we, that Sunday we were in church. Pastors asked us to give a, a testimony of what, we, what happened. So I really didn't even know the Lord had touched me and healed me. I just knew I went down, hot fire come on my head, and I went out in the spirit for 45 minutes and was drunk. But other than that, I didn't know God had healed me until like a week or two later after I came home. But we got up, and we just told everybody in the church what, was, uh, what, what it was like, and I told about the heat. But we made sure not to tell about the manifestations that we did see in Toronto, the same things here. Because I said, well, God, you know, if this is you, which I knew it was, I said, we won't have to say a word. It will just come to this church. So we made sure not to mention anything. And that morning over here, well, we, Cheryl and I finished and we went and sat down. And over here in this section of the church, uh, Georgia, Georgia stand up. Georgia hadn't been, to, uh, came to the Lord too long, maybe a year. And she was over here and Benny and Hazel were over there. And the power of God, and we got up and we were worshiping, and the power of God hit uh, Hazel. She was pregnant and fell out in the spirit. Of course, she's pregnant again. She stays pregnant. <laughs> I, I don't believe I've known her too many times, but she wasn't pregnant. But anyway, this is her seventh child, by the way. But anyway, she was over there, and she had fell out. And her husband, Benny, said he was not able to cry. He had a lot of hurts in his life and he had wanted to cry but he was never able to cry like he wanted to and that morning God broke loose the river and he was bawling and crying and Georgia hold this pastor was doing like this the whole time while pastor was preaching he went on after the worship uh, and praise he went on and started preaching she did this the whole time he preached for 45 minutes the same thing I had seen in Toronto, and, and it was so exciting to me. It was a sign. Cheryl was across the room. I didn't know if she could see what I was seeing, but I was so excited. I couldn't hardly contain myself, and so I couldn't tell anybody, so I took my little uh, paper out, and I wrote Holy Spirit a note. I said, Oh, Holy Spirit, you're here just like you were in Toronto. I said, George is hungry, Lord. I said, make us hungry like her and come. Well, then a lot of things started happening in my life, and, and then this glory came on me, and that's an, another long story I won't get into. But at first I was so, I didn't, because people were kind of looking at us strange when we came back from Toronto, like, you know, what are they doing, what, you know? And I was so self-conscious, always been so self-conscious, God forgive me. But uh, being a pastor's wife, you feel like you're in a glass house and everybody's looking at you. And sometimes you can just look up and people are staring at you, you know, and it makes you feel so uncomfortable, people. And I have lived in that bondage for years of always just, you know, and it was my own fault. It was my something of my own making that I've always had a, uh, just a wall up there and tried to be the perfect pastor's wife, which <laughs> who knows what that was like. But, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I, and, and the first time that happened in church, just a little bit of it was on me, and I was, I was trying to fight that because I didn't want anybody thinking I was weird, and, and I knew it was God, but yet I really didn't know it was God. I was, you know, kind of said, Lord, what is this, you know? And so... The Lord really dealt with me like, uh, and he said, I'm in control of your life now. You will not care what others will look at you and say. And I, in my heart, made up my mind, yes, sir, no more. Be the bondage of what people think about me. I don't care. Jerk me around. Knock me over. Fall in a lady's lap. 
whatever you want to do. I am free, free, and I thank God for that. <laughs> One more. <laughs> My name is Carlene Curry, and I live in Baldwin County, Alabama. Um, I've been coming here for about a year now. My, my sister and brother-in-law, um, the ones that have the little baby, Victoria Teich. Yeah. This is their church. I'm Sharon's sister. Yeah. Um, we visited here off and on through the years, and I've always felt the Holy Spirit here every time I've walked in the door. And we've been coming here for about ever since the revival broke out. Um, I'm a regular attender. I've had the honor um, of seeing both of my sons baptized. Praise God. But really, I've never said, spoken in front of the group before. And really what the Holy Spirit said to me a few minutes ago was, come up here, you have to tell everyone that you're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I had a dream about three weeks ago and a lot of people are going to think it's crazy. I wanted to share it. I, I shared it with my sister and I, I wanted to call you and tell you. I wanted to call Steve and tell him, you know, and I thought, well, that's just silly. That's just crazy. <laughs> call up and, you know, tell a dream. But the Holy Spirit spoke to me a few minutes ago and said, Go up and tell your dream. Okay. So here we go. We were here at the church. This parking lot out front was just full of people. There were no cars, just people, just as far as you could see. You, the, the, the prayer team, Steve, we're just going in and out of the crowd, praying for people. They were just everywhere. People were everywhere. <laughs> Somehow, I was right along behind you. Nobody was in my way. I was just right everywhere you were, I was. Towards the end, I hadn't been prayed for yet. Towards the end, you were off praying for someone else, and Steve was about to get in his car, by the way. The Lord revealed to me what kind of vehicle he drives. I won't say that, <laughs> but it was confirmed later on. I had no idea what kind of a vehicle he drove. Before he got in, uh, a couple of the guys had to help him get into the van. It's kind of like you had been at times, and they would have to help you. So they helped him, and uh, he got in, and I was standing right there. And as he looked at me, he began to speak blessings upon me. And when he opened his mouth and spoke the blessings upon me, a circle came out of his mouth. And it was the colors of the rainbow. And I knew that it was the glory of the Lord. And as it got closer to me, it just got bigger and bigger. And it engulfed me. And it went on beyond. And when I woke up, in my bed, the glory of the Lord was on me. <laughs> you know what? We're having, <clears throat> we're having so many people tell us that before they felt the glory that they dreamed they went into glory. They're, they've dreamed it. A lot of people's dreamed it. And right after that, it would happen. Before I ever received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I had a dream. I'd had dr several dreams that I'd wake up uh, in my dreams. I'd be speaking in tongues in my dream. And shortly thereafter, I went right through to it. It was like a barrier was broken in my dream that helped me go through to it when I was awake. And uh, we've had a lot of people say that they have felt in their dream the glory of the Lord come over them. I'm going to tell you a real quick dream I've been having repeatedly. This is crazy. I told you a while ago I was crazy. I've been preaching lately and left the platform, and I was moving around up there in the beams in the top of the church preaching down at y'all. <laughs> the beams was, was in my head and on my neck, and I was moving the beams over like that, moving myself over and preaching down at y'all. I was floating up in the ceiling. Hey, it's not impossible. You know, Hector, this is the truth, Hector, that here, you know, he prays for Steve from Argentina. 
he was preaching in Argentina not too long ago, and he was six foot in the air preaching while he was preaching in Argentina. You say, oh, that's levitation. No, the devil levitates. God just lets the glory come. Hey, friend, listen. What do you think is going to happen at the rapture? We're just going to take off and just take off and go away. So I don't know. It's crazy stuff going on, but I tell you, it's going to get crazier the closer we get to the coming of the Lord. God bless you, folks. We love you. We'll see you. Hey, we're going to be off Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, but don't forget, Friday night we're coming back up.